Um, without further ado, would you please welcome Amir Safadi. <laughs> Calvary Chapel, why don't you say hello to Amir? Thank you. God bless you, Amir. Hey, shalom, Bob. What a great morning uh, over there to see all of you guys there. Uh, it's evening here, and it's not a quiet one. Yes, you, uh, he texted me just a little while ago saying that our, our connection and our ability to meet might be hindered by some present rockets coming in. Uh, so you want to tell us a little bit more about that before we get going? Yeah, uh, in the last uh, few hours, we had uh, a uh, massive barrage of rockets and anti-tank missiles that, are, uh, that hit some Israeli citizens uh, uh, along the border, as well as mortar shells that uh, were fired. Uh, so all three mark a, a great escalation. And as of five minutes ago, uh, if you follow me on Telegram, you, you probably saw uh, Israel just began to drop leaflets uh, above southern Lebanon. And we are asking everyone in southern Lebanon to leave immediately. Leave your home immediately right now. And that, normally we do that because we are planning to uh, step up our game uh, and not just... Uh, wait for them to continue to shoot at us, but to have a major military operation. Bear in mind, uh, Hezbollah just began shooting ever since October 8. I mean, it's, we, there was nothing that uh, we did to the Hezbollah uh, or uh, they did to us on October 7 that required them to shoot at uh, October 8, but they began uh, something that only went further and escalated further and further and Israel chose to not uh, focus on the Lebanese side because we want to finish our job in Gaza first but we may not have any other option and um, it's going to be a very very long night because we live right by the northernmost military air base and uh, we're expecting a lot of takeoffs this evening. Wow. Well, our hearts go out to you and your family. First of all, we want to just know, how are your family going through this together? Uh, how, how are you? They're, they're okay. Uh, I mean, as much as a, a family can do well in a, a war uh, that began with a mini Holocaust that uh, a lot of us were exposed to online, some, some of us live online, but... Um, uh, yeah, we were separated uh, for a while. Uh, I sent uh, some of them abroad, but they came back last night. My daughter is in the military. My son is joining the military also. So, um, yeah, half of us are in the effort, uh, in the war effort, and the others are trying to live normal life, uh, which is almost impossible at this point. Well, let me just say on behalf of uh, hundreds of thousands of Christians who are reading Telegram posts constantly, we don't know when you sleep, we're, we wake up and you're always on there, and uh, thank you. We need to know what's going on, so we appreciate you. Um, thank you. So I think of October 7th and that phrase that all of us as Americans think of, a day that will live in infamy in, in the 21st century, that is certainly true of that day. So here are some questions you and I have talked about that I think would be helpful for us. Can you explain briefly why the conflict began? We know what happened, but here specifically what I'd like you to share with us, what do you believe the plan, the goals of Hamas mm. were? And if you wouldn't mind, share a little bit with us about something that you've talked about, I know on Telegram, in terms of maybe what Hamas's plans were with others that was yeah. foiled. I think it's really yeah. valuable to share that. So just uh, to uh, make things clear, six months ago, I already posted a, um, an article. I, I, I wrote an article about a scenario that we believe is uh, plausible 
uh, where uh, which not just a scenario, what we think the, the Iranians are plotting, which is to basically uh, bring all the proxies that they have created over the last 15 years or so around us, the proxies from Iraq and Syria and Lebanon and Yemen, and of course, in the West Bank and in Gaza, and on the day of battle to instantly, simultaneously start a massive barrage of rockets, mortar shells, uh, suicide drones that would paralyze Israel for days. And under the guise of that paralysis, uh, to enter into Israel, take as many settlements and towns and military uh, bases as possible, take as many hostages as possible, kill as many civilians as possible, and m eventually basically bring Israel to a, uh, on its knees uh, to surrender. And that was the plan. That was the plot. That was what they've been working on for the longest time. And, uh, and we saw them training for it in Lebanon. We saw them training for it in Gaza. So we, we kind of knew that somewhere, at some point there, they might want to try and do that. What we did not see coming is the fact that Hamas will decide to jump their gun and do something earlier than, uh, than the day of battle of all fronts together. And it kind of took us by surprise. Now, let me, let me explain. We, we started seeing some very, very, um, very suspicious signs throughout the night. We, but it was exactly the same thing we saw earlier when they used to gather before one of their exercises. So they apparently for a whole year put us to sleep with their exercises and their um, routine that they created. And, uh, at the, you know, eventually they chose a day that Jewish people are, uh, are celebrating and that's a sh both Shabbat and the latter part of Sukkot, of Tabernacles. Um, and uh, very early in the morning at 6.30, they began the most deadliest and brutal and barbaric terrorist attack in the history of the nation, of the country, of the state of Israel, that can only be equaled with the bar barbarism and the uh, number of deaths per day to the Holocaust. Wow. And so, yeah, there is nothing else that you can compare it to. And it's not, it's not a surprising thing. They planned it to be that way. In fact, today in a BBC interview, uh, the president of Israel uh, showed a book that we found in one of the houses in Gaza as we are now inside. I don't know if, uh, if we can show that book on the screen, but... Uh, it's basically, it's a, it's a book of uh, Adolf Hitler, Mein Kampf, that was translated to Arabic. And you, we, we also saw parts of the book were highlighted and there were some notes inside. They, they literally wanted it to be a mini Holocaust. They studied from the writings of the person who did something like that the last time. And that's the book, as you can see on the screen, and that's the Arabic translation. And this is what we found right now in one of the houses in Gaza. And uh, again, we have, we have a business with Nazis. <laughs> and in fact, in, and I, I will be very, because it's church and it's Sunday morning, uh, so I'm not going to go in details. But the things that were done by those Nazi Hamas, ISIS the terrorists, were to some degree even worse than the Nazis, to some degree. And I, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to uh, go into details, but, uh, I, and I don't even know if you have children in the sanctuary right now, you probably do. Uh, but um, I don't think I saw photos of Nazi officers holding 
body parts the way uh, these animals did. Um, we, you know, in the Holocaust, we found a lot of dead bodies and we found a lot of ashes and, and you know, and that's it. What we found here is ashes, but we found parts of bodies because they would pile them up in piles of legs and piles of le heads and piles of, we had to put them together in order to identify the person. We, it's almost like a puzzle. Uh, the stuff that we've seen and, and the, the stuff that was, by the, by the way, very proudly broadcasted live through their GoPro cameras and their cell phones, um, it was unbelievable. Uh, <laughs> but the most amazing thing, Pastor Bob, is the fact that most of the people that are protesting around the world today they don't even know that it's happened or they don't even talk about that. For them, the war started on October 8th. Israel is the villain. And that's it. No one talks about October 7th. And I myself know personally people who doubt that it happened. Yeah. Now, think about it. 80 years ago, the Holocaust took place. And there are Holocaust deniers. This thing happened a month ago. It was live broadcasted. Everyone saw it as it took place and people denied. So we, I can conclude this is a very diabolic spirit. Uh, and it's a demonic uh, attack that we are watching. It is in the spiritual realm as well as the physical one. And um, I can only tell you that as I watch what's going on around the world, first I see the unbelievable anti-Semitism, which is very much satanic because he hates Israel, hates the Jewish people, just because of who they are in the eyes of God. But the other thing is, I also see a pre-flood generation that is marching the streets of New York, of Berlin, of London, and Copenhagen, and Paris, and other places, literally pre-flood generation that has absolutely no regards to anything that has to do with God. And they are with so much hate, and it's crazy. Wow. Well, I specifically remember you sharing years ago with me about things about 9-11 that Americans didn't know, as horrific as that day was for us, but what was planned, what was intended, that never came about. And how, in my mind, there seems like a correlation as horrific as October 7th was, that Hamas took action on their own as opposed to being a part of this bigger plan that they wanted the glory or something, and as a result, even though it is horrific, we can be grateful that God alerted Israel and the IDF to be able to respond. You're right. Uh, I see a lot of good things that, unfortunately, out of such a terrible thing, I see a lot of good things that came out. I see the hand of God working. I see, and let me let me let me explain. Uh, Hamas, and I think also that was the general uh, consensus among all the Iranian proxies. They thought that throughout the last year, Israel is falling apart from the inside. They looked at our divided society. They looked at uh, the way the protesters in Israel um, weakened the military, they weakened the judicial uh, system, they weakened, I mean, the fabrics of all society. They, there was a horrific um, animosity between religious Jews and secular Jews, between right wing and left wing, uh, it was terrible. It, uh, it was a country I could not even recognize. We were on the brinks of falling in, in, in a, a very uh, a deep. Uh, uh, it was on a precipice right there, falling very deep. And, and I think that um, the enemy interpreted that as if we hit them hard and fast, they'll fall apart. That's it. Because they're already weak. What we are witnessing right now is that we are stronger than they thought. They are stronger than we thought. 
let's face it, if we didn't think they are as strong, if we would, if we thought they are as strong and as determined, we would have been readier than when you know what happened. But they they were more looking into the tactics of the day rather than the strategy of what's next. They never really counted on being in where they are right now. They, in their wildest dream, they never thought that we will be 200 yards from their main headquarters underneath the main hospital in Gaza. I mean, they, they would, I mean, for them, for the last, uh, everything's 2005 when we completely pull out of Gaza, 18 years, as not a single Israeli soldier set a foot at the, that hospital area. And um, they built the largest terrorist camp on planet Earth, the largest terrorist facility on planet Earth. And they built it with a budget that was larger than the Marshall Plan for Germany. And it was um, it not only made their leaders billionaires, but also Gaza Strip uh, being two level, the level above the ground and the level under the ground. There are 1300 tunnels, 500 kilometers in total length. And some of them are over 200 foot deep under the ground. We are talking about 30 to 40,000 uh, terrorists that are now under the ground, hiding under the ground. So when you have 2 million people, civilians, we need to take them out to bring, I mean, give them a, a safe way out so we can come in, fight the terrorists, and now we are dealing with what's underneath the ground. And uh, eventually when all the civilians will be out and when we will think that we got full control over what's above the ground, we're going to drown them inside with water and other elements that we came up with. And so th they are upping their game in the social media and public protests because uh, a lot of their sponsors, Iran and Russia and even China, they are using TikTok and social media to push disinformation and to completely brainwash uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people uh, to think that we are <laughs> committing war crime. Whereas by the way, not only that we do not commit war crime, the war crime is to operate as terrorist organization underneath hospitals, underneath mosques, underneath schools, underneath clinics, underneath youth uh, uh, playground. That's the war crime. And under the Geneva Convention, we have the right, by the way, to attack all of those places. But you know, when we arrested all of those terrorists that we captured alive, and bear in mind, we killed 2,000 and we caught 1,000. And when we, when we uh, interrogated them, they said to us, we, I mean, they gave us a detailed information about everything. And they said, we, we built most of our headquarters underneath schools and hospitals because we know Israelis never bomb hospitals. I actually want to show you something from a few hours ago. Uh, during the night, because there is a, a situation in El Shifa Hospital, um, Israel s at night risked its own soldiers to bring three, I mean, I don't know if you can see, to bring hundreds or if not thousands of liters of diesel gasoline in order to let the hospital staff conduct major very, very um, um, uh, up major, uh, you know, surgeries. Take a look. These are Israeli soldiers that risked their life to put all these jars full of gasoline. They come out of their tanks to do that, and then they get back. And just so you know, Hamas prevented the hospital staff from using this, this uh, gasoline. Now, by the way, one anti-tank rocket 
hitting this gasoline jar would have killed all these Israeli soldiers. In fact, this is the most, I would say, uh, okay, I, I won't use the word, but it's not, it's not that smart to walk like that in the middle of an enemy camp, but yet we did that. I, I will also show you another video that a lot of people don't know. And it's a video that was released last night secretly by one of the nurses inside that hospital. But for that, we need the volume. I don't know if you're able to, to because she speaks in English. I don't know if you can do that, but if, if you can, let me just tell you, she is basically... But the world has to know, has to know what Hamas is making here. They're taking over the entire hospital. They're taking over the fuel, the medicine. I have nothing to treat with. I have to fix a fracture for a five, a five-year-old boy without morphine. Because Hamas took it to themselves. Ya Allah, please, please, if you, if you hear me, please leave, run away, don't stay here, please. Ya Allah, ya Nas, itla'u min, itla'u min hon, itla'u min shifa. Ya Allah, I can't believe I'm doing this. Ah. Well, basically, she exposed Hamas. She, she said, I can't believe I'm doing that, but I have to tell you, Hamas is stealing our medicine. They took the morphine that she needed for, to treat this five-year-old. They take the gasoline because they need to use gasoline for the ventilators, for the engine of the ventilators. If they're under the ground, they need, you know, all the ventilation to work, all their communications to work. Listen, the world doesn't know that, but the biggest atrocities that are done, not only by killing 1,400 Israelis in the most barbaric way, not only by kidnapping 240 Israelis, of which some are babies, one of them is nine months old, some of them are Holocaust survivors in their 80s, all of them are held under the ground right now. And that's, that's what started this war. And they do that to their own people. They're using the, by the way, there was a a, a terrorist there that was uh, situated in one of the buildings overlooking the Rantisi hospital. And he, he basically had his soldiers there and they threatened 1000 people that if they leave the hospital, they will be killed. And Israel was able to eliminate him and his soldiers uh, in, in, in a strike. And all the people in that hospital managed to escape and managed to move south. Listen, got, these yeah. things, people, yeah, people don't know that because for them, we drop bombs and we kill people. That's what, this is what they think. Now, the funny thing is that the world believes the numbers that Hamas is giving when Hamas is the most untrustworthy organization ever. First of all, if you remember a few days into the war, one of their failed launches landed in a hospital in, in Gaza and killed some people. A, they accused Israel. Then B, they said 500 people died. Well, in few hours, it was evident that it was a Islamic Jihad rocket and there was only 40 people who died. So when you take their numbers, they mean nothing because if they report for something, 500 people dead, which by the way, nothing supported that, Not, no videos, no witnesses, nothing. But they take their words always as this is it. And they doubt our word. When we're a country that is providing evidences and providing footage, providing everything, that's what we have to deal with. And just three days ago, we exposed honest reporting, if I'm not mistaken, honest reporting exposed that CNN, AP, and Reuters are hiring Hamas people as photojournalists. These people knew about this terrorist attack. They joined the soldiers in the terrorist attack and they, they reported as it happens. We have them standing there looking at how 80 year old woman is being kidnapped on a, on a motorcycle. And there, you see them taking photos of it. 
And you see them inside the Jewish kibbutzim and towns and taking photos and reporting from there. All of that done by journalists, but they're all part of the, this whole thing. The United Nation. The United Nation has a UNRWA, uh, uh, yeah, which is United Nation W is for work and then Relief Association, UNRWA. Did you know that this organization only exists for the Palestinians? There is no organization on planet Earth that is dedicated to second or third generation of refugees. There's no such thing, second generation. Refugee can only be the person who was kicked out of his country or who had to leave. That's the refugee. If you're a 20-year-old Ukrainian and you left to Germany and you are a refugee and you married someone and you gave birth, your son is not a refugee. For the Palestinians, he is. The Palestinians are the only people in the world that enjoy the status of refugees, second, third, and fourth generation, because every person who is counted as a refugee gets money. And who gets the money if not their leader? So the workers of the United Nations uh, uh, Work and Relief Association are all Hamas people. So when, when people tell us, let's give the UN um, uh, gasoline and medicine and all of that, guess who? Who gets it eventually? So people don't know that. And the, the biggest suffering population uh, from the hands of Hamas is not the Israelis. It's the Gazans themselves. Wow. In fact, right now, when the Gazans feel that we are uh, about to eradicate Hamas, they start finally speaking out and saying the truth. But they couldn't say that before. They couldn't because they would have been shot to death. If you only knew what Hamas did to their own people, they used to tie them to motorcycles and drag them on the streets. These are animals. And I don't understand how can anyone protest on their behalf. So there's a lot of misinformation, but I think overall what we see is demonic activity, demonic activity of demons that are now attacking the minds of so many people all around the world, including Christians. Yes, yes. Including Christians. So there's a satanic deception that we know is clearly going on in our day in the minds of those terrorists, first of all, but beyond that in the world as they are uh, claiming a, a righteous cause. But I want us to back up the camera a little bit, um, and meaning a little bit broader. And I'll, if can you just help us if, if we don't know here in the room, what nations right now are involved with attacking, or, or groups, not nations, but groups, are involved with attacking or threatening to attack Israel currently, and what nations, I don't know if there's a, a number, but are publicly supporting Israel's invasion into Gaza to remove Hamas. Can you give us a sense of yeah. what that looks like? Yes. So first of all, there is no nation that is now attacking Israel. This is a classic deception. What we are seeing right now is Iranian proxy organizations that are not nations, that are not governments. Within Lebanon, we have Hezbollah, but Hezbollah is not the government of Lebanon. Hezbollah is not the army of Lebanon. Within Syria, we're not being attacked by the Syrian military or by Bashar al-Assad. Within uh, Yemen. We're not being attacked by the legitimate Yemeni uh, uh, government. We're being attacked by the proxies, the Houthis. Within Iraq, we're not being attacked by the Iraqi government or the Iraqi military. We're being attacked by the Iranian proxies in Iraq. So for all those people that come up with, oh, Psalm 83 is being uh, right now uh, fulfilled, let me tell you something. Psalm 83 speaks of nations. It speaks of countries that indeed came about to destroy us when we declared our statehood and changed the name to Israel. That's why they said, let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel will be remembered no more. And they are from Lebanon and Syria and Jordan and Egypt and even Iraq. All that 
was fulfilled in 1948. All of that, those were countries, those were leaders, and those were militaries of those countries that came up to destroy us when we declared statehood. What we see now is proxies of Iran that for the most part are not um, encouraged by the government that under which they're uh, operating. Now in Gaza, Gaza, you know, there is no Palestinian nation or state. So I would say that's the only place where a, so to speak, government has come against us, but they're a terrorist organization. They're not really a, a government uh, per se. So these, so what we see here today is that we have terrorists from Yemen, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Gaza and the West Bank that are coming up against us. Literally from, from south, west, southeast, from the northwest and from the northeast. That's what we have. The border with Jordan is clear. The border with Egypt is clear. Uh, Egypt and Jordan, not only that are friends or at least have peace with Israel, but in yesterday's emergency meeting in Riyadh, they were opposing the harsh resolution against Israel. And by the way, with them, the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Bahrainis, and the Moroccans and the Sudanese, all the Abraham Accords countries all opposed it. So, the, so even the Arab world is not reunited behind the Palestinian cause. They all know, by the way, by the way, isn't that interesting? 16 countries absorb Ukrainian refugees, 16, among them Israel, by the way, 16. Tell me how many countries absorb Palestinian refugees from Gaza right now? None. Tell me how many Arab countries? None. Jordan and Egypt said that they rather go to war than to open their borders for Gazans. Why? Because they know the Palestinians. They know Hamas. They know exactly who they have to deal with. The last thing they want is to have that in. By the way, we took the West Bank, if you remember, when we conquered it from the Jordanian occupation in 1967, and we took Gaza when we conquered them from the Egyptian occupation in 1967. Both Jordan and Egypt signed peace with Israel, and they said to us, we don't want the West Bank or Gaza. You can keep that one to yourself. We want everything else you took from us, whether it's Sinai or whether parts of, of area by the Jordan River for the Jordanians, but we don't want the West Bank and we don't want Gaza. This one you'll have to figure out yourself with these people. Look, um, may I also direct people to a book that was beautifully written in the 80s by a woman called Joan Peters. Uh, she wrote a book called From Time Immemorial. From Time Immemorial. She's a Jewish journalist, an investigative journalist that worked for CBS in those days I think journalists were a bit more honest and hardworking people than, than most of them are today. And um, so she came and she started working on finding the problem of the Israeli-Arab uh, conflict. What are the causes? And by the way, she was funded by the Carter administration in order to write something that will be on the Palestinian side. Uh, when she was exposed to the archives, when she was exposed to the numbers, to the facts, she was shocked. She returned the down payment to the Carter administration. She said, well, I'll write the book, but I don't want your money and I don't think you'll like it. And the book exposed several things. One of the most important one is the land was not as populated with Arabs as they're trying to tell you. In the 1800s, when Mark Twain came he actually wrote in his journal, uh, in throughout my entire journey, I hardly saw one living soul in here. He testified of the desolation of the land and the underpopulation of the country. And she also proved from the archives that most of the Arabs that moved into the land moved into the land following the Jewish immigration because they saw opportunities that came with it. Um, in fact, you don't have to go that far. Uh, remember in 19, uh, I think in 1917, not mistaken, uh, there was a peace treaty that was signed between Arabs and, Israel, and Jews. 
a peace treaty that most of the people on planet Earth are not aware of. A peace treaty between the leader of the Muslim world and the leader of the Zionist organization. Chaim Weizmann, on behalf of the Zionist organization, and um, uh, Faisal, the son of the Sharif Hussein, that was the head of Mecca and Medina in those days. And uh, in the peace agreement that they signed, the Arabs admit that the land that today we call Israel belongs to the Jews. They encourage Jewish immigration con to continue back to the land. And they actually said, we not only encourage that, but we, we want you to promise us that you will help us build the Arab state in Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon, and Iraq. But the Arabs were smart enough to add one thing to that agreement, and that this agreement is spending the British fulfillment of all of their promises to us. And of course, the British never fulfilled their promises, and, and that's it. That was the end of it. But even if you see leaflets of the Muslims about the Temple Mount in the 1920s, you see that they admit it is the place of Solomon's Temple in their own writings. Everything changed in 1948. Why? Israel was born. The name was given back to the land and the original owners are back from the ashes of the Holocaust. Thus, Ezekiel 37 was fulfilled. And everything yeah. changed and that drove them crazy. I also want to remind people that the name Palestine has nothing to do with Arabs. In fact, it is only related to the history of Israel, the biblical history of Israel, not to any Arab or not to any Muslim. It was related to the Philistines. And when the Roman emperor Adrian wanted to humiliate the Jews because they rebelled against him, he changed the name of the country to be named after the Old Testament foes of the Jews, the Philistines. That's why we call it Palestina. And this is it. It had nothing to do with Arabs. Allow me also to remind you in Nehemiah chapter 2, when Nehemiah describes how he returned back um, to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple, look what he says. He says, uh, but when uh, Senbalat in verse 19, chapter 2, when Senbalat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard of it, of me coming back to build, they said they laughed at us and despised us. And they said, what is it that you, that this, what is this thing that you are doing? Will you rebel against the king? They thought that the act of rebuilding Jerusalem is rebelling against the king uh, of, of, uh, of uh, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the Persian king. And so I answered and I said to them, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. And then he says, therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. And look what he says. Nehemiah says to the Ammonites, Horonites, and the Arabs. Horonites are Syria. Golan is Horon. Horan. Ammonites is Jordan. Ammon, Ammon. And the Arabs from Arabia, all the way. All the stuff that is surrounding us. He's basically telling them, but you, Arabs, Ammonites, and Horonites, you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. Basically, he says, you'll never understand why I left the palace of a king, traveled and risked my life all the way back to this land to rebuild it because you have no right, no memorial, and no heritage in Jerusalem. That's it. Amir, can you give us any idea uh, from your perspective currently what nations have gone public and in support of Israel? Who have been the greatest outspoken to say, we are with you, we stand with you, do what you need to do? Obviously, we are thankful uh, for our president's stand in that. We pray he would continue to encourage Israel to do what they need to do. But what nations, in addition to ours, ah. have stood with you guys? <laughs> so the nations that stood with us are the nations that have so many Arabs inside them that they're so afraid that 
what happened on October 7 will happen to them as well. You're talking about uh, UK, you're talking about uh, the French, you're talking about Western Europe in general. Uh, and you're, you're also speaking about some of the Eastern European uh, countries, such as Hungary and the Czech Republic, uh, Poland and others. Um, and um, now let me surprise you. The Arab countries around us are waiting patiently or in, impatiently almost for us to completely dismantle Hamas. You need to understand Hamas is not just the Muslim Brotherhood that is outlawed in all Arab countries. All Arab countries outlawed. The only country where they're not outlawed is Turkey, which is not Arab. And by the way, Erdogan is Muslim Brotherhood. And Israel, believe it or not, because we're a democracy and we cannot outlaw such a political movement. Okay, and, but um, it's not allowed to be, uh, you know, to, you know, in, in Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. In, I mean, in Egypt for sure. Egypt. Mohammed Morsi was Muslim Brotherhood, and and of course, uh, Assisi toppled him. And look, let me let me make it very clear. What we're about to do or what we are doing already is being carefully watched by the entire Arab world. All the Middle East is watching carefully. And the reason why Iran is not sacrificing Hezbollah and all of its other proxies right now is because Iran does not want to lose these, these assets at this point because they see that we're, we mean business, we're crushing Hamas. And they don't want to lose another asset that they have. They rather wait for another, I don't know, a couple of years and try to surprise us again somehow. Um, maybe they try to wait until they have the nuclear power and, and that they can flag and, and wave at us with. Um, pay attention though to the fact that Russia and Iran and Turkey are now posing an alliance that uh, is definitely to be noticed. Um, alliance that is based on their interests. The Russians do not want Israel as a competition for any pipeline uh, of gas, natural gas, or even oil through the Middle East. The Iranians, of course, want Israel destroyed and to spread the Shiite Islam. And the Turks, uh, the Turks wants to represent the Sunni world. They, they want to be the saviors of the uh, Sunnis uh, and to bring back their status of the caliphate that was lost when Ataturk abolished the caliphate from the Ottoman Empire. So all of these things we see, everyone has his own interest, but eventually it will, we will see a convergence. By the way, it's interesting that everyone has his own interest. Um, if you follow me on Telegram, you saw maybe a week and a half ago, uh, I, I showed a video of uh, protests in America where there is an Antifa guy and Palestinians and they go together to protest against Israel. Yeah, why not? Let's hate the Jews. But then the Antifa guy saw a sign against sex change. And so he confronted the, the guy and then he found out that the Palestinians are also against sex change. So <laughs> you realize that the only thing that brings them together is the hatred towards Israel. But on every other level, they don't agree on anything. So that's what Ezekiel 38 is. Every one of those countries has its own thing going on. But the one thing that is common for them is that to get what they want, they need to destroy Israel. Finally, what I'd like to do is if you could, because obviously we're wanting to be engaged in prayer and care and support of Israel right now and what's happening. We care about these hostages uh, being rescued and, and of course we're wondering, you know, what is the likelihood of that? We don't know, but would you help us also with this issue? Because as believers and you yourself committed to teaching on prophecy, give us your perspective. We know that um, what, what scripture has to say about the future um, yeah. Do you see any relationship to the uh, alignment of what is happening right now and any future fulfillment of either the Ezekiel or, or Isaiah 17? Anything that you would want to share with us about any of that? Yes, absolutely. Well, first of all, uh, I see a lot of things that will later on be manifested in a greater way in the future. First of all, I see 
that this unprecedented wave of anti-Semitism and the unbelievable Jew hatred that was displayed on October 7th, it, it caused two things to the Jews. The first thing, it caused Jews around the world to doubt if they're even safe wherever they are. And maybe, after all, Israel is our only. You see, as Americans, you don't have any other country to flee into if, if something goes wrong. Jews do have. <laughs> the Israel is their safe place. If, if something goes wrong in America or in France or in Germany, the Jews there know that they can on the spot, get on the plane and become automatically the citizens of the only Jewish state in the world that will protect them. So we are watching how many, many Jews around the world are now coming back to Israel. So there's a massive return of Jews back to the land, which is a fulfillment of prophecy. Another thing we see, there is a massive exodus of Jews from secularism into God-fearing slash Orthodox Judaism. I would say that. We're watching that. The, the places that are producing phylacteras and prayer shawls and all of that, they cannot keep up with, with the orders. We're talking about every soldier that goes to Gaza right now demands to enter with a religious Orthodox kit of prayer shawl and phylactra and all of that. It's not that the army has to give it to him. They ask for it. Um, we never had such a thing before. Now, remember, up until a month and a half ago, there were so many seculars that hated the religious Jews. And now we are stronger. We are united. We have such resolve. It's an iron fist that we, I mean, I'm telling him, even if you see some demonstrations, that those are the fringes of the fringes of hundreds of people only that 95% of the Israelis will not agree with. But of course, the media will magnify it in order to you know, make things look that way. But I will tell you that this exodus from secularism towards religious um, uh, mindset is, uh, is going to continue. And then, as you uh, mentioned, we're going to have something that will cause Damascus to be destroyed. By the way, God doesn't tell us how. God says it will cease from being a city. Whether Israel will do it or whether Israel will not do it, yet be blamed for it, we, we don't know. But it's, Damascus won't be there eventually, and it's still there, which means the prophecy about it has not been fulfilled yet. But we eventually know that there will be an alliance of five countries coming mostly from the north to invade into Israel, all the way into Israel, and they will be humbled and defeated by the God of Israel, not by the military of Israel, by the Lord God of Israel, not in a, in a military way, but in a supernatural way. And that will cause the Jews that were already on their spiritual journey back to God that will cause them to see the power of God and say, okay, we live in Messianic times. That's it. And guess who rises after Ezekiel's war to offer himself as a world Messiah? Yeah, guess who difference. is the one who will offer them a, a temple, right. who, who will get all this religious aspiration and Messianic expectation? Who is going to harvest all of that, if not the Antichrist? And the one thing that will cause a third of the Jews to say no to him is only halfway through when he will demand to be worshipped as God and put the abomination of desolation in the temple. And only then a lot of the religious, the, the very faithful Jews that will not see that as a good thing, to them Jesus said, don't even go home, flee, run, pray that it's not on the Sabbath, pray that it's not in the winter. And um, so, again, there's a lot of future prophecies. Some of them are with what Jesus said about Israel in the tribulation. Some of them are about Isaiah uh, 17 and Ezekiel 38. But what we see right now is the conditioning of the hearts of the Jewish people and the return of the Jews back to the land for that uh, sake. 
And we're also going to see how uh, God will once again, now remember, Ezekiel war can only come when Israel is safe and secure without walls. This is what the government is promising now to the people. It says, let us crush Hamas and let us crush Hezbollah so we won't need fences anymore. We won't need to defend ourselves endlessly. And, and so we, I conclude from all of that that we will definitely have victorious uh, ending to this war. But that will, of course, be the introduction to the Ezekiel one. So the Jewish people in the land of Israel are going are up for a roller coaster, a war that will bring peace and safety, that will bring a bigger war, that will bring fake peace and a temple, and that will bring a greater greater, um, uh, well, the greatest persecution that will end only when Jesus himself will come back to the Mount of Olives and they will recognize him whom they pierced, as Zechariah 12 says. So I, I think we're watching, we're living in times where all of those things are, you know, a preparation for, for, for that. And when those things begin to happen, they happen in a very quick succession. And we're, we're about to see it. Even everything that is going on right now, look at the quick succession in, in the way things happen, not only in Israel, but all over the world, how it affects the whole world. So you have to be very careful. I would warn a lot of Christians, first of all, stick to the Bible. Don't add to it. Yeah. And second, and I think this is the tragic thing that I've, I've watched over the last few weeks. Too many Christians are falling into conspiracy theories and those conspiracy theories are nothing but stuff that is echoed by propaganda started by the Russians and the Chinese and the Iranians. And I see Christians falling into that. And they come up with horrific theories that, uh, that will only, if you only say that, not only that it's not true and it's not based on any fact, but if I was a non-believer as a Jew and I would hear a Christian say those things, I would think that they are the most anti-Semites Semite people on planet Earth just by ways of, of doing that. Because when somebody suggests that Israel not only knew about it, but encouraged that, but planned it, you're basically saying Israel wanted a Holocaust. And that's exactly the same way of thinking that a lot of people use when they deny the Holocaust. They say the Holocaust wasn't really the Germans. The Jews perpetrated that in order for them to have a state a few years later. Same spirit. So now they come up with Netanyahu knew about it because he had some plans with Trump or there was a, a, some sort of a, a, a channel of water from the Red Sea through Gaza. These are baloney. These are, I don't understand how in the world you fall into this and you, you believe those things? I mean, who in the world is going to, I mean, th what happened? And the funny thing is that the, the Palestinians documented what they did. They admit what they did. The Israeli intelligence admit its failure <laughs> to detect that coming. Everything is there. They refuse to believe that because for them, um, Conspiracy is way more appealing. Stay away from that because eventually those conspiracies will bring you to places of Jew hatred and of not being a great testimony and a great, uh, uh, you know. And uh, from what I see around the world, uh, God is giving us a picture. It's not the fulfillment, but it's a picture of how one day Jesus is going to separate the sheep from the goat. And he's going to ask them, what, did you do all these things like taking care of me when I was sick, when I was naked, when I was hungry? And they said, what are you talking about? He says, if you did that to the least of my brethren. And, and if you are not on the side of Israel right now, if you're not there when they were butchered and massacred, if you're not there to support their right over the land and their right to live, basically, in peace and in security. If you don't, if you don't have that, 
um, you have a problem with the way you view the word of God and the way you understand the words of Christ even. And uh, if, you, if you cannot even support them now, how much more you will not support them throughout the tribulation if you are not being taken. You will actually, you will actually be on the other side. And that's exactly what this trial of or the, the, the judgment of the sheep and the goats is all about. How in the world did you treat Israel during the tribulation? So if you can't treat them the right way now, when it's not as bad as the tribulation is going to be, that tells me that I'm not even sure about the way you perceive salvation and the way you understand the words of Christ in regards to Israel, the way you read the book of Romans to begin with also. Uh, I, I will... I will Warn people to stick to the word of God, to be more in the word and less in, on YouTube um, yeah. and, you know, drown yourself endlessly with all of these conspiracy theories. You know, Amir, as you share about not only what's being believed there in the Middle East, but all over the world as uh, there are so many marching in the streets, even in our own country, I think of that passage where Paul says, refusing to believe the truth, God says, I'll send strong delusion upon them and so that they'll believe a lie. And you would think with technology and, and being able to see things in real time, there'd be no question about it, and yet technology is being used by the enemy, and falsehoods travel at the speed of lie today, and people are just believing things that are absolutely not true. So we are so grateful for you. We wanna, we're gonna pray today at, at, when we disconnect with you for you and your family, for your nation, um, that as you know and believe that the God who keeps Israel will neither sleep nor slumber, that he'll Amen. keep them as the apple of his eye. And before they come to the Zechariah, seeing him whom they have pierced and come to faith in Messiah, they do have to come back to a faith in Jehovah. They have to come back yes. to a faith in Yahweh. And so may God use this for good, what the enemy means for evil. May God turn it around for his glory yes. and for the expansion of Israel. They are going to go into Gaza. They are going to make it a safe place. I, I heard Netanyahu just say this earlier this morning. That is what's going to happen. And uh, they're not going to allow the United States or anyone else to tell them how to execute this war because they're going to do what's best for their people. And we support you. We love you. And we're grateful for you. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Shalom. Shalom. Folks, let's all stand at this time. We're going to have the worship team come, and I'm just going to lead us in a prayer for Amir, for his family, for Israel, and even for our nation. Would you just bow with me? Father, I pray now your peace upon my brother. I love him. I miss him. I am so grateful that you have him right now, just as you did, Esther, for such a time as this, in a position where he can share with those that are willing to hear the truth all over the world, use his telegram to expand, Lord, our knowledge and understanding of what's happening, what's really happening, and how to pray. And Lord, the spirit of deception that's all around the world, even in some of our own families where people are believing lies, where friends of ours are, are separating from each other over the issue of how Israel is executing this war and accusing Israel of in fact what Hamas is guilty of, this genocide. Lord, would you allow the truth to dispel the lie? Would you exalt the truth? And I pray, Lord, that we would be uh, ambassadors of truth for those around us. But we do pray for every single hostage. Lord, we pray they'd be discovered and, and released. You can deliver them. Lord, supernaturally, miraculously, allow the enemy's plans to be completely thwarted. We pray that every Hamas enemy would be destroyed or defeated or surrender. And we do pray, Lord, as you told us to even love our enemies. It's hard for us to do that in our own minds, but Jesus, you loved us when we were your enemies. So we pray for the salvation of souls on both sides of this war and around the world. Use this as an opportunity to share the spiritual battle for souls and for lives and for eternity. But Lord, have your blessing upon Israel, and may we see in the days and the hours to come your protection and the supernatural miracles you did in each of the previous wars. Lord, would you do them here for your glory and your son's name, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. 
Amen. We love you, Amir. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you.